Hello and welcome to the uh, next increment of the GPS course. This is lesson four and we will be discussing uh, GPS receivers and some of their common characteristics uh, and uh, some of the methods that are used in uh, GPS uh, surveying. This is of course the Block 2 satellite and uh, we will uh, move on to some of the basic uh, elements of a typical GPS receiver. GPS receivers uh, come in a variety of shapes and sizes, uh, but most of them have the same characteristics. And I would like to go over this uh, schematic drawing of a typical uh, GPS receiver and discuss some of the common components and what they do and how they do it and uh, this will give you, I hope, some idea of uh, how the uh, GPS signal is transformed into a measurement through the uh, components of the receiver. It's undoubtedly the most important hardware in a GPS survey and uh, the capabilities of the receiver affect the results. Obviously, for example, a uh, purely uh, pseudo-range or code phase receiver uh, would uh, probably give uh, less accurate results than a receiver that uh, took advantage of the carrier phase observable. GPS receivers, uh, depending upon their uh, makeup, are capable of accuracies that uh, range from submeter uh, to sub-centimeter and even in extraordinary work uh, to millimeter accuracies. There are many techniques that are used uh, in GPS receiving of course, but the receiver itself has common components. Some uh, require external antennas, uh, some uh, have external batteries, uh, data collectors, some are tripod mounted, some are handheld uh, that have all components built in, and some can be used in, uh, in both ways, uh, with externals and, uh, and without. From the point of view of a uh, GPS satellite, the Earth uh, presents a disk that really, uh, from 11,000 miles up, uh, has a spread of approximately 28 degrees. Now the signal from a GPS receiver is not uh, at high power in the beginning and then it spreads over this uh, very large area. As I say here it's uh, instructive to compare it to the typical signal from a communication satellite which has much more power and also a very directional signal. But uh, the dish antenna that is needed to receive a, that sort of signal is not what we use with our GPS receivers, of course. Our antennas that we use are not directional. They don't need to be pointed anywhere in particular except, of course, generally up. And uh, the GPS satellite uh, is sending a signal over such a large area that uh, it's it's rather weak. It's rather it's rather low power. So of course uh, it's easy for it to get lost uh, in uh, overhead cover leaves. Uh, it's uh, also is subject to interference from electromagnetic noise. But as I said uh, earlier, it's a spread spectrum signal that we receive from a GPS satellite, and because of that. Uh, there is a certain amount of robustness uh, to, that can be done to pre prevent jamming, uh, mitigate multipath. Uh, so even though it's a weak signal, the design of the signal uh, it comes to our rescue uh, to some degree and allows it to be sorted by the receiver from the uh, surrounding noise, uh, interference, and uh, obstructions up to, up to a point, of course. Uh, GPS uh, is not going to penetrate uh, substantial cover. Uh, so of course that's something that uh, is a small drawback. The antenna of a GPS receiver must convert 
the electromagnetic waves that it receives from the satellite uh, into electrical currents that are sensible to the circuits of the receiver. Now there are many sorts of designs that the GPS saddle, GPS antenna could uh, uh, could have, but since the signal is such a low power uh, and and has to make its way through the atmosphere and various other uh, troubles, the GPS antenna must have a high gain or or must be quite sensitive. Now an antenna could be designed uh, to receive just one of the carriers or both. But as I say here, in all cases, uh, they must be able to handle right-hand circular polarized signals, which of course is what the uh, GPS signal is. It is right-hand circular polarized, and that's what this uh, uh, graphic is intended to uh, illustrate. As you see, as you look uh, in the direction of the propagation of the signal, it rotates. Um, uh, that's what the boxes with the arrows are indicating. It rotates to the right. I mentioned this earlier when we were discussing multipath and want to underline it again that when the signal bounces it then goes from the right hand circular polarized uh, component to the left hand. And this is of course one way that uh, a multipath can be ameliorated. As mentioned earlier, there can be antennas on a GPS receiver that are built in, and, and many of them are. Or a receiver can uh, uh, accommodate an antenna to which it's connected by a cable. In this case, frequently tripod mounted or range pole mounted. Now these connecting uh, coaxial cables are usually at uh, standard lengths. This is uh, in an effort to uh, make sure that the impedance uh, of the of the, tra of the trip through the cable can be uh, calibrated uh, to the receiver and always be the, in the same increments. Here are uh, four antenna styles or, or design types. Uh, in the upper left hand corner the micro strip patch antenna is undoubtedly the most common. It has a low uh, profile and is very uh, uh, robust. As I mentioned here, uh, antennas that have a quarter or a half wavelength uh, tend to be the most practical, so uh, they can be as small as four or five centimeters given the fact that the uh, uh, GPS carrier's wavelengths are uh, uh, right around 20 uh, centimeters, 19 and 24 to be specific. The uh, microstrip uh, can uh, receive uh, one or both of the uh, GPS uh, carriers. There could be two patches, one for each frequency. Uh, the next most common is the uh, dipole, which is uh, uh, below. Uh, now these uh, pictures indicate just the type of antenna, not necessarily uh, specifically GPS antennas, but the dipole you see there uh, in the lower left. Uh, you may recall that this is uh, in general the kind of antenna that was used with the uh, macrometer, the first uh, uh, functioning uh, GPS receiver. Dipole has a stable phase center and simple to construct. It needs a ground plane and of course uh, you can see microstrips and the other types with ground planes as well. A ground plane facilitates the use of a microstrip as I see here at ameliorates uh, multipath and it tends to increase the antenna's zenith gain. In other words the uh, gain of the antenna straight up. A quadrifilar antenna which is in the upper uh, right is a single frequency antenna has two orthogonal bifilar uh, helical loops on a common axis. They uh, perform better on boats and airplanes and things that uh, pitch and roll and yaw. Uh, there's also many uh, recreational handheld uh, uh, GPS receivers that use th that type. Some antennas, uh, such antennas, have a good gain pattern and don't need a ground plane. The least common is in the lower right. This is the helix antenna. It is a dual frequency antenna, has a good uh, gain pattern, but a high profile. And as I say, the antenna that undoubtedly is the most uh, common, it's uh, uh, not only durable, but has a simple uh, construction, it's compact and uh, a low profile, is the microstrip. And the microstrip uh, is used uh, in many surveying GPS receivers.
These diagrams are intended to illustrate the bandwidth with which the um, GPS antenna must contend. And of course, uh, the design of the antenna should be, as I say, commensurate with its application. Now, the GPS microstrip, the most common, usually operates in the range from 2 to 20 megahertz, which, as you can see in the diagram, corresponds to the null to null bandwidth of both uh, these existing legacy GPS signals and, and actually uh, the signals that are to come. For example, we've uh, mentioned the L2C and uh, this, just like uh, the uh, CA, uh, has a span of 2.046 uh, megahertz as you see in the highest portion or the central lobe. Now L5, which is the new carrier, which is to come, and the uh, P code, or the also in, in the encrypted Y code, have a bandwidth of 20 uh, 0.46 uh, megahertz, as you see uh, in the uh, right-hand L2 signal structure, and, and you can also see it over in the left on the L1 and the red. Uh, therefore, the antenna, the front end of the receiver, uh, if it's going to collect uh, the P-code on L1 and L2, it has to have that uh, bandwidth, it has to be able to accommodate that bandwidth of 20.46 megahertz. Uh, if the system's tracking CA code or the L2C, it could have uh, a narrower uh, bandwidth only need uh, 2.046. Now, many uh, receivers, of course, are designed to, to uh, accommodate uh, both and therefore would need to accommodate the larger uh, bandwidth. A dual frequency microstrip antenna would likely operate in a bandwidth from 10 uh, to 20 uh, megahertz, generally. Now I've mentioned uh, here and there the gain pattern and here is a diagram of this idea. Uh, you can think of this as a vertical slice uh, uh, through the gain pattern of the antenna. Uh, GPS antennas of course are intended to be omnidirectional meaning that they should uh, uh, receive the uh, signals over a wide range of azimuths and elevations that, that make up nearly a full hemisphere and as you see as you see here in, in this diagram it's not perfectly hemispheric but for most applications the GPS antenna wants to filter out the low uh, elevation signals and you can see how that works here um, that it uh, would would not receive those that are at the lowest. This this doesn't uh, uh, obviate the need for a mask angle, of course. The contours of equal phase around the antenna's electronic center, which is what we're looking at here, that is the phase center. It's not perfectly uh, spherical, as as you can tell uh, from the from the picture. It's really a three-dimensional spheroidal uh, shape. This image is a vertical cross-section of the antenna gain pattern, and uh, this would be representative of the cross-section over a 0 to 360-degree uh, azimuth range. Now, a gain of 3 to 5 decibels, uh, symbolized D large B, is typical for a GPS antenna. Uh, just a brief description of a decibel. We'll be seeing a little bit more of this again in some of the uh, PSD diagrams. The decibel is a unit for logarithmic measure of relative power of a signal. It's a tenth of a bell, which was named for Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, dBW, uh, decibel watt, indicates the actual power of a signal compared to a reference of one watt. But actually the decibel alone is uh, dimensionless. It's a, a ratio. In the context of an antenna, if a decibel is defined by comparison with its idealized isotropic antenna, which would be a, a lossless sort of antenna, it is written a DBI or DBIC, sometimes pronounced DBIC. And as you see here, if you can uh, see it on this diagram, uh, these units uh, uh, are indicated uh, in Dbics. You see negative 4, negative 2, 0, and then 2, and then at the very top, 4. So this uh, diagram does in fact uh, uh, show the gain pattern operating in the neighborhood of 3 to 5 uh, uh, decibel watts uh, compared to the isotropic antenna or 
Divix. Continuing with the discussion of antennas, uh, when they are used uh, in a accurate uh, GPS uh, control survey, you may notice that on the ground plane you'll see an arrow. Uh, this is really a, a guide to making certain that all of the antennas that are used in simultaneous observations of baselines are oriented in the same direction. Generally, the way it's done is that the antennas, several, let's say three or four receivers, uh, all of their antennas would be oriented to north. This means uh, they would all be pointed in the same direction. And of course, you may ask uh, why that would be of interest. Uh, the reason is because the physical center of an antenna is not exactly coincident with the phase center of the antenna. And of course it's the phase center, as we were looking at in the gain pattern diagram, it's the phase center that is of interest to the uh, receiver. That's where the signal uh, is actually pinpointed, if you will. But of course when we center an antenna over a point, we can only center it by its physical center. If the two were exactly coincident, it wouldn't uh, be uh, any concern whatsoever uh, that the antennas uh, are all oriented in the same uh, direction. But since there is a difference between the two, the concept is, by orienting the uh, antennas in the same way, uh, the offset that is inherent in that difference would always be in the same direction, and so therefore the baselines would come out uh, exactly uh, the same as if the physical and the phase center were coincident. As I see here, it's important to remember that the position at the each end of a GPS baseline is the position of the phase center of the antenna and not the physical center. And that the phase center is not actually an immovable point. The location of the phase center changes slightly with the uh, satellite's signal, for example. It's different for L2 than for L1. In addition, as the azimuth intensity and the elevation of the received signal changes, so does the difference between the phase center and the physical center. These small azimuthal effects can be brought on by local environment around the antenna. Now, of course, this difference uh, that we're talking about can be, and usually is, at a few millimeter uh, level. So for uh, the more... Uh, rough work, it isn't that uh, vital. It's only when we're talking about uh, control work, work that uh, needs to be quite accurate, that it's uh, valuable to have all of the antennas rotated and oriented to the same azimuth. One of the uh, errors that is quite avoidable but uh, often corrupts uh, the baseline measurements of a GPS survey is the antenna height, the height of the instrument. Here in this diagram you see very many ways of uh, measuring that height. It can be measured to slat height uh, or measure with a tape, usually to the antenna reference point. Now the ARP or the antenna reference point is frequently the bottom of the mount uh, of, of the antenna. Uh, of course then there's usually a correction that is needed to be added uh, to actually bring that uh, measurement up to the phase center of the uh, of the antenna. Now this uh, also becomes uh, part of uh, necessary information when one is using continuously operating reference stations. We talked uh, earlier about the fact that it is possible to take the downloads from CORE's stations that are available on the internet and post-process uh, the uh, observations taken with a roving uh, GPS receiver. When that is done, uh, it is necessary to know the height of the antenna at the base station. Now, of course, that uh, is not an antenna that you would have set up, but that information is available uh, along with uh, the uh, files from the base station. It's important, of course, to also know not only the height of the antenna reference center, but the offset up to the face center. And that is actually consistent uh, uh, a consistent value with uh, the particular type of antenna that you're dealing. And this information is also fortunately published on the web. We will talk about where uh, 
a little bit in, in, in the future. Now, moving away from the antenna, and uh, speaking of the next segment of a typical a GPS receiver, the preamplifier. Now, the preamplifier is necessary because, as I pointed out, the uh, signal coming in from the GPS satellite is uh, rather, rather weak. And uh, therefore, it needs to be uh, amplified to some degree to be uh, accessible to the rest of the circuits in the, in the receiver. As I say here, the uh, preamplifier increases the signal's power, but it's important that the gain in the signal coming out of the preamp is considerably higher than the noise. Uh, this is, uh, of course, always part of the signal. The uh, signal-to-noise ratio uh, is a critical portion of the uh, statistics of any uh, GPS signal. Since the signal processing is easier if the signal is arriving from the antenna on common frequency, the incoming frequency is combined with the signal at a harmonic frequency. This latter pure sinusoidal signal is the previously mentioned reference signal generated by the receiver's oscillator. The two frequencies multiplied together in a device known as a mixer, uh, and then the two frequencies emerge. One of them is the sum of the two that went in, and the other is the difference uh, between them. Uh, now, the sum and the difference of the frequencies then go through a bandpass filter. This is an electronic filter that removes the high frequencies and selects the lower of the two. It also eliminates some of the noise. For tracking the p-code, this filter will have a bandwidth of about 20 megahertz, but it will be around 2 megahertz if the CA code is required. In any case, the signal that results is known as the intermediate frequency, or IF. It's also known as the beat frequency signal, which is illustrated here. This beat frequency is the difference between the Doppler shifted carrier frequency that came from the satellite and the frequency generated by the receiver's own oscillator, this reference. In fact, to make sure that it embraces the full range of the Doppler effect on the signals coming in from the GPS satellite, the bandwidth of the intermediate frequency itself can vary from 5 to 10 kilohertz. That spread is typically lessened after tracking is achieved. So what's happening here is that the signal is coming in from the satellite. It's uh, being amplified. Then it is being combined with the reference signal to achieve an intermediate or beat frequency. And this is the difference between the Doppler shifted. And of course, the signal from the satellite is Doppler shifted. Uh, and the frequency generated by the receiver's own oscillator. These are put together. And uh, then this IF can vary from 5 to 10 kilohertz Doppler. The point of the discussion is to try to illustrate what the uh, preamplifier, the mixer, and the bandpass filter uh, do. But the next step after these are achieved is, of course, we're not talking about just receiving one signal from one satellite. We're talking about receiving a minimum of four and perhaps many more uh, uh, from uh, four to more satellites. And as I see here, there are usually several IF stages before the copies are sent into the separate channels. And of course, that's the next, the next step. There are more usually today more than one channel in a, a GPS uh, receiver. The replica of the C or the P code, CA or the P code, is generated by the receiver's oscillator and now that is correlated with the IF signal and it's at this point that the pseudo range is measured. Remember the pseudo range is the time shift as you see here we looked at this uh, before. The receiver also generates another replica, and this is, of course, the replica of the carrier, as you see on the right. The carrier is correlated with the IF signal, and the shift in phase can be measured. The continuous phase observable, or observed cycle count, which we talked about as a beta in an earlier uh, lesson, is obtained by counting the elapsed cycle since lock-on and by measuring the fractional part of the phase of the receiver-generated carrier. As I say, the next 
step is uh, the assignment of these signals to the channels in the receiver. The signals from several satellites enter the receiver simultaneously and the channels of the RF section, the undifferentiated signals, are identified and segregated from one another. And a channel, it's, it's not unlike, as I say, a channel on a TV set. It's, it's a hardware or a combination of hardware and software that can do this separation. Now, only one frequency from one satellite is on one channel at a time. That's the way the receivers generally work today. Now, in the past, there were receivers that were multiplex receivers. In other words, they had a very few channels. And what they would do is they would track the signal from one satellite for a time, and then they would shift over to another, and then back and forth. And this was a way to uh, get along with uh, very few channels. But it had a tendency to increase the noise in the signal, and uh, tracking was not as sure. Today, it is uh, common for uh, receivers to have many channels, uh, 8, 12, even more. Uh, some receivers have 24 or, or, or more than that. And, of course, uh, the concept here is that each signal can go into its own channel and be handled uh, uh, there. This is a good thing. It, it reduces the noise in the signal. And you may ask, why would it be that it would uh, be a good idea to have more uh, the channels than there are satellites? Well, one reason might be, as we're going to discuss later on, that uh, as GNSS uh, matures, there will be uh, uh, quite an increase in the number of satellites that are available, not necessarily GPS, uh, Galileo, GLONASS, and others. And uh, if interoperable receivers are uh, going to uh, be achieved, then uh, perhaps there would be useful to have more than uh, the channels of uh, 24 or The tracking loops that we see in the schematic diagram at the top, um, they're the code tracking loops, the delay lock loops, and the carrier tracking loops, which are also known as phase locking loops. The tracking loops are connected to each of the uh, receiver's channels and also work cooperatively with each other. Uh, the dual frequency receivers have dedicated channels and tracking loops for each frequency. Now, most receivers uh, use the pseudo range as the front door, so to speak, uh, for the incoming satellite's uh, synchronization with the CA code on the L1. And the replica code is used uh, to accomplish that, as we've discussed. Now, the for, for, for what we're looking at here on this slide, recall that when there's not an initial match between the satellite's code and the receiver's replica, the receiver time shifts or slews the, the code, its, its, its replica code, until it finds that optimum correlation. And remember, the optimum correlation occurs when that little calculation I showed uh, results in 1, exactly. Now, when the uh, uh, code tracking loop is, is, is the delay lock loop is functioning, it keeps them aligned. The time shift discovered in the process is a measure of the signal's travel time from the satellite to the phase center of the receiver's antenna, and multiplying this by the speed of light gives a range. And as you see in the diagram, uh, the incoming signal is in the green at the top, and then the receiver replica, we have an early and a prompt and a late, uh, illustration. At the bottom there's this code correlation uh, and as you see the, the in the left it goes from 0 to a half uh, to, to 1 and correlation peak would occur at 1 and as one shifts the time as the as the receiver shifts this replica code it can find when the prompt chip is it exactly a match with the incoming signal uh, because the prompt is exactly at the peak. Uh, 
And once the receiver has achieved lock, it has access to that navigation uh, message and can read all of the information that's there, the uh, ephemerides, the almanac, the uh, clock correction, uh, and so on. You can use the handover word when every subframe is a stepping stone to tracking the more precise code, but the code pseudo range alone is, as we've talked about, not adequate for the kind of accuracy that we generally expect from, uh, from GPS. And of course, not only does the receiver produce a replica of the, of the code, but also a replica of the incoming carrier wave. The incoming signal from the satellite is subject to ever-changing Doppler shift, uh, while the replica within the receiver is nominally consistent. Now the carrier tracking loop, which is part of the receiver, uh, the process usually begins after the pseudo-random noise code has done its job and the code tracking loop is locked. And by mixing the sig satellite signal with the replica carrier, uh, the process then eliminates all the phase modulations. It strips the code. This is after the code has been, has been locked and the approximate position is available. Then the, then the receiver strips the codes by combining the signals and it simultaneously creates two intermediate or beat frequencies as we've talked about. One is the sum, the other is the difference. The receiver selects the latter the difference with a device known as a bandpass filter and then this signal is sent on to the carrier tracking loop also known as the phase lock loop where a voltage controlled oscillator is continuously adjusted to follow that beat frequency exactly. And this gives you some idea as to how a GPS receiver locks onto that carrier and stays locked. And of course, this is the, the, the way that the higher accuracy is achieved uh, than could be had with the code phase alone. Now we've talked about the Doppler shift in several different contexts. One was the uh, original transit system, the uh, NNSS system that operated on the Doppler shift and I was mentioned earlier that the GPS system uses the Doppler shift as an observable so it might be useful to have a concept of how much shift is typical with a, a GPS satellite and this uh, this graphic is intended to indicate that as you see on the left with the uh, satellite rising or moving toward the receiver, the Doppler shift is approximately four and a half to five cycles per millisecond. And as the uh, satellite goes through its path relative to the receiver, at zenith or at its closest approach, the shift is uh, nominally uh, zero. And then it goes from the positive to the negative portion, uh, again, returning to approximately four, to four and a half to five cycles per millisecond when it's moving away and setting uh, uh, relative to uh, the receiver. This steady change is reflected in this smooth and continuous movement. And of course, that is a very predictable uh, uh, change. And the fact that it's predictable and the, cha the fact that it is, 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 is consistent makes it a very good observable. The rate of that change is reflected in the constant variation of the signal's Doppler shift. If the receiver's oscillator frequency matches these variations exactly as they are happening, it will duplicate the incoming signal's shift and phase. This strategy of making measurements using the carrier beat phase observable is a matter of counting the elapsed cycles and adding the fractional phase of the receiver's own oscillator. And this is, of course, the way that the phase lock loop uh, maintains its uh, lock on the signal as the Doppler shift occurs with each of the satellites that it is tracking. Now, this idea has application in signal processing. It can be used to discriminate between the signals of the various satellites to determine the integer ambiguity and it can help in detection of cycle slips. We've talked about that idea of discontinuity or, or loss of lock as a cycle slip. And as an additional independent observable, 
But perhaps the most important application of Doppler data is the determination of the range rate between the receiver and the satellite. The range rate is a term used to mean the rate at which the range between the satellite and the receiver changes over a particular period of time. With respect to the receiver, of course, the satellite is always in motion, even if the receiver's static or, you know, on the, the surface of the Earth. But the receiver may be in motion in another sense. In kinematic GPS, it may be on a moving platform like a, like a, a vehicle, for example. And the ability to determine instantaneous velocity of a moving vehicle has always been one of the primary applications of GPS and it is based on the fact that the Doppler shifted frequency of a satellite signal is nearly proportional to its range rate. So obviously if the platform is moving there is a relationship between the Doppler shift nominally from the satellite and the change based upon the movement of the vehicle on which the receiver is uh, finds itself. Now I've talked about the typical uh, uh, change of four and a half to five cycles per millisecond uh, when the uh, satellite is at maximum range, just as it is rising or setting. And of course it reaches nominally zero when the radial velocity of the uh, satellite is zero or, or at closest approach. But as the satellite recedes negatively, the Doppler shift once again reaches its maximum extent, just as it sets. Now the continuous integration of the Doppler shift uh, is one of the ways that the observable can be used to refine position. The difference between the two, that means the incoming frequency and the reference frequency generated by the receiver, this intermediate or IF that we've talked about, there is actually a beat frequency uh, over a given time interval that's known as the Doppler count for that interval. And since the beats can be counted much more precisely than their continuously changing frequency can be measured, most GPS receivers just keep track of the accumulated cycles, or the Doppler count. Now this is a, 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 a aspect of a receiver, continuously integrated Doppler, or CID, that is always a, a worthwhile and welcome addition to the full complement of observables uh, used by the receiver to determine a position. Now we mentioned earlier that the pseudo range is the uh, beginning gambit with a GPS receiver in most cases to determine the approximate position of the receiver using the code phase. Now after the code phase measurement narrows the field of, of position, there are three methods to solve the integer ambiguity. This is, of course, that uh, n, or number of full wave cycles between the receiver and the satellite at lock-on. Now the first method is known as the geometric method. The carrier phase data from multiple epochs uh, is processed and the constantly changing satellite geometry is used to find an estimate of the actual position of the receiver. This approach is also used to show the error in the estimate by calculating how the results hold up as the geometry of the constellation changes. Now it works pretty well, but it depends on a significant amount of satellite motion and takes some time to converge. And as I've pointed out before, it is not the fractional initial phase in a GPS receiver's uh, determination that takes time uh, and the reason for occupying a point for a good long period. It is rather the solution of the uh, N or the integer ambiguity that can take some time. Now the second approach to solving the integer ambiguity is filtering. Here an independent measurements are average to find the estimated position with the lo lowest noise level. And the third uses a search through the range of possible integer ambiguity combinations. It then calculates the one with the lowest residuals. These, the search method and the filtering method depend on heuristic calculations. In other words, cut and try or trial and error. Now these approaches can't assess the correctness of the particular answer, but it can calculate the probability uh, that the answer is correct within a set of limits. 
Now, the truth is that most GPS receivers use some combination of these three ideas. All of them narrow the field uh, by beginning an initial position established by the code phase measurements and then using one or more of these methods in combination uh, to come up with the most probable integer value um, for the uh, solution of the integer ambiguity, which of course is the key to carrier phase observations. Moving from the uh, RF section into the microprocessor. Now of course the microprocessor in a GPS receiver is the small computer. It's the uh, brain that uh, uh, manages the collection of the data. It's uh, digital circuits that can do everything from extract the ephemerides to mitigate multipath and noise and, and, and so on. This is the, the, the home of the software uh, that drives the uh, receiver. Now the receiver uh, also has some sort of uh, storage uh, unit. But more and more the uh, microprocessor is expected to serve up the uh, position of the GPS receiver in real time. We've talked some about the uh, RTCM corrections coming from a broadcast of a base station, uh, but microprocessors are, are expected to handle more and more of the uh, heavy lifting to determine a position of the receiver uh, instantaneously or close to instantaneously and then serve it up in the CDU, which is the control and display unit. And of course, there's a two-way street between the microprocessor and the control and display unit. And of course, another uh, method of getting instantaneous or close to instantaneous positioning from a GPS receiver is the navigation solution, as illustrated here, or the autonomous solution without differential positioning. Now. Um, these units uh, that do offer this uh, using the pseudo range uh, observable uh, have made some extraordinary claims but but the truth is since the switching off of selective availability it is true that uh, uh, the autonomous or navigation uh, solution uh, can achieve accuracies uh, 20 to 40 meters uh, on a consistent basis they're not surveying uh, levels of accuracy but uh, still it's possible to achieve this. Now there's, I should mention, another method that we'll talk about uh, in a bit later, uh, which is called PPP, uh, that will uh, uh, allow, using the use of an extraordinarily precise ephemeris, uh, autonomous positions to uh, do much, much better than this level. Uh, however, it bears repeating that uh, when an autonomous position is uh, achieved with GPS receiver, it has to be based upon the corrections provided in the navigation message, which, as you know, uh, have a certain amount of, of uh, weakness. Now, returning to the uh, differential uh, GPS area, where uh, more accuracy is achieved, here we have known as uh, DGPS, Differential GPS. Uh, this uh, particular method illustrated here uh, generally is a code solution, uh, but it has the capability of uh, uh, delivering a sub-meter accuracy on a fairly consistent basis. As you can see, the requirements are a base station, which is, uh, is at a known position, receiving constellation of satellites, the same constellation being received at the rover, that's important. A code phase solution requires at least four satellites minimum. And there needs to be a radio link. In other words, uh, this broadcast of these RTCM corrections, uh, given the fact that the antenna that is transmitting knows its location, and uh, these signals can be received by the rover with an unknown point, with the receiver uh, getting the signal from the satellites, the same constellation as the base, and the uh, radio transmission with the uh, corrections, it's possible for DGPS to achieve um, submeter accuracy in real time. Now, of course, uh, the uh, transmission or the the base station antenna needn't be on a building; it could be on a on a tower, it could be a, a satellite, and there are services. Um, that allow you to subscribe to a correction signal. Uh, 
in those cases, the base stations are uh, more than one, are uh, collecting uh, the constellation, compiling the uh, correction message, which is then beamed up to the satellite, and then the satellite beams that same message back down to the subscribers. And uh, this is a way to achieve real-time correction and submeter accuracy. Now it does depend on code phase solutions or pseudo range observations and there have to be at least two receivers of course one on the base and, and, and one at the unknown point. Now such data can also be post-processed it needn't be in real time in that case of course the base station would download to memory and uh, to storage and so would the uh, rover and then they would be brought together in a computer and, uh, and post-processed. This is a uh, uh, typical arrangement for GIS sort of data collection and a lower uh, accuracy GPS uh, surveying. More and more, uh, this sort of solution also uh, is starting to incorporate some uh, carrier phase. Now here we have uh, another kind of differential GPS known as real-time kinematic. In this case, we're talking generally about a phase solution, a carrier phase solution, as you know, would generally be more accurate. Here we're talking a couple of centimeters. The uh, base uh, length uh, on the previous slide was uh, 100 to 200 kilometers, and here that's reduced by a factor uh, one order of magnitude to down to 10 to 20 uh, kilometers. However, the same basic arrangement is still there the constellation of satellites being tracked at the base station and also tracked at the rover. The base station at a known point, in this case on a tripod, uh, so that it can be moved, but here it's on a known point. And the transmission antenna is still there separately, but uh, uh, that is transmitting a real-time uh, correction to the rover. Again, the same components. Now in this case, uh, it's carrier phase as opposed to pseudo range, and the minimum number of satellites is five. The reason for this typically is that, of course, um, for our, our minimum for a uh, solution, and in this case, uh, uh, five, so that one can be lost and still uh, assured that there will be a, a solution. The uh, accuracy can be at the centimeter level with this sort of arrangement. And it is becoming more and more the case that uh, surveying is uh, relying heavily on real-time kinematic. Of course, the next uh, element of a GPS uh, receiver is the CDU, or the Control and Display Unit, and there's a wide variety of these. Some uh, have uh, keyboards and soft keys on the screen, uh, even the touch, uh, the uh, Touch screens are available uh, in uh, GPS uh, receivers and uh, controllers. They all have the same purpose. This is, of course, the interface between the operator and the receiver's microprocessor. Um, a wide variety of what can be selected. Uh, obviously, the methods, the epoch interval, uh, the mask angle, antenna heights. Uh, there can be data conversions. Uh, it's, it's quite extraordinary, the number of variations. A typical display. They vary from receiver to receiver, but when four or more satellites are available, they can be expected to, uh, to display the PRN numbers of those satellites and uh, the receiver's uh, position in three dimensions with velocity information available. Then there's the storage. Uh, and of course, uh, this uh, slide is here to illustrate that uh, we have moved uh, dramatically, as you all know, uh, from the miniaturization of storage so that uh, things such as cassettes and floppy disks and the old tape drive that we saw in the micrometer are things of the past and now um, storage in a receiver is uh, um, not terribly demanding in terms of size. Of course, though, presuming that the data received, as I say here, from a single GPS satellite is approximately 100 bytes per, per epoch, a typical 12-channel dual-frequency receiver observing six satellites with one-second epoch over the course of an hour would require approximately two megabytes of storage capacity for that section. And, uh, of course, if there are multiple sessions, then this gets to be a substantial amount of 
of data. And of course downloading this data generally happens to uh, a, a computer with microprocessor uh, for uh, post uh, processing uh, if needed. The power of a typical receiver is battery power. And of course there's a wide variety of batteries. Some GPS units, particularly recreational units, can uh, run from disposable batteries, uh, AA batteries and so on. However, uh, more sophisticated receivers require a, a little bit more uh, robust uh, power supply and there are uh, really uh, three commonly used uh, battery types, lithium, uh, NiCad or nickel cadmium and uh, nickel metal hydride or in uh, NMH. Now, of course, uh, in the old days, and even today, with base stations, you can see the, them being run from old lead-acid car batteries. Now, the lead-acid has some good aspects. It's certainly robust and, and continuous. Uh, they're weighty and have some size problem. Uh, but they're hard to beat when it comes to high power uh, that for a long time and uh, at an economical cost bulky and with obvious drawbacks. But the NICAD uh, of course costs more than lead acid but they're small and they operate well. The NICAD noticeably uh, f see a decline in in their power as the uh, temperature drops and of course they're quite toxic but uh, their self-discharge rate of 10 percent a month and uh, they do have memory difficulties. The full discharge uh, is necessary from time to time. But they have excellent cycle life. The um, nickel metal hydride, uh, probably not used quite as much. Uh, they self-discharge a bit more rapidly than the NICAD. Now the lithium ion is becoming more and more uh, common. They uh, don't require discharging and don't have the memory problems. They're light, uh, low toxicity, and uh, they, do, they do rather well. But uh, the drawback is uh, it's best to not charge the lithium ion at low temperatures. Uh, they do require a protection circuit. But they're widely used, and uh, lithium ion are, are coming to be more and more common in GPS receivers. GPS uh, carrier phase. Almost all have an internal power supply and can operate for uh, five to, to eight hours actually. Most code tracking receivers uh, can operate longer uh, with less power, 15 hours at the same size battery. And it's fortunate that the designers of uh, GPS receivers have found ways to operate them at uh, relatively low power. Uh, I can recall that with the micrometer we had to run them on a 110 volt circuit and had to have a generator and a bank of batteries, lead acid, to, to run them. And so this, uh, this world of uh, small compact power supplies is uh, welcome, very welcome. Now concerning uh, GPS uh, surveying methods. We've talked a little bit about DGPS and we'll talk more about it. We've also talked some about uh, real-time kinematic or RTK and again well, we'll talk more about that. But the first method of GPS surveying and a method that still uh, is uh, adequate and, and, and appropriate to doing uh, control surveying is known as static. This of course is a case where the uh, GPS receiver remains, remains stationary for a period uh, from 30 minutes uh, to two hours typically and uh, if uh, this sort of method is used uh, to do control, it's found that uh, one part per million uh, to a tenth of a part per million over tens kilometers are certainly achievable. Now, uh, there's very little that has to be in place uh, for uh, static surveying to work. Obviously, four or more satellites in a mostly unobstructed sky. Uh, but things, for example, as uh, overcast skies and, uh, and other aspects uh, certainly don't limit uh, GPS receivers or static surveying. And here is a diagram uh, approximately of the kind of uh, 
session lengths that are required for GPS uh, static surveying. And this is, of course, approximate, but uh, for example, eight satellites, uh, a 10 kilometer baseline uh, would require something between a half an hour and an hour. Uh, but four satellites, uh, the same length of baseline might require something between one and two hours. Uh, and so, of course, there are a variety of, of, of session lengths required depending on the conditions. Of course, as we've discussed, the uh, position dilution of precision uh, needs to be uh, low. The signal to noise ratio uh, needs to be high. And uh, the number of satellites in the constellation needs to be considered when uh, trying to determine how long a static session should last uh, to achieve, uh, to achieve uh, acceptable results. There's a large amount of data that is um, accumulated in uh, one to two hours of static surveying, considering that there are more than uh, one receiver operating simultaneously, and of course uh, uh, many satellites. As I've mentioned, the fact that uh, some one must uh, occupy a point for a, a continuous period with static surveying to achieve good results might lead uh, one to think that the problem is uh, getting the accuracy, in other words, the fractional initial phase, uh, which in fact happens uh, almost immediately. It is, as I pointed out, the cycle ambiguity problem that usually takes the time to resolve at all receivers so that all baselines can, can be, uh, can be co correctly determined. The receiver doesn't lead the long session to make the fine distinction it needs the long session to solve the integer number of cycles between itself and the satellites, the so-called cycle ambiguity problem. In fact, it is unique handling of precisely this difficulty that allows kinematic method to achieve high accuracy with very short occupation times. But of course, it must be remembered that with kinematic surveying, the uh, receiver can achieve this initialization and solve this cycle ambiguity by virtue of the fact that it's receiving a correction signal from a base station that knows exactly where it is. In the static application, the receiver must resolve this phase ambiguity anew with each occupation so the sessions are long. But in kinematic method, the receiver resolves the phase ambiguity once and only once at the beginning of the project and then keeping continuous lock. It's solved throughout the work. But a real-time kinematic can initialize so quickly because it has this, uh, this correction signal uh, available uh, to it. Now the subject comes up from time to time as to whether or not receivers of various manufacture uh, can be used on the same project uh, together at the ends of even the same baseline and the answer is yes of course and the reason is because fortunately there is a uh, format, a file format that allows one to use receivers of many types together. That file format is known as the Receiver Independent Exchange Format, or RINEX. It was developed uh, by the Astronomical Institute in 1989. Very useful because uh, it means that despite the uh, type of receiver, uh, the files that are downloaded uh, can be brought together and used together uh, using this, uh, this wonderful common uh, file structure. And so here on this uh, chart of some uh, typical And so here on this uh, chart of some 
uh, tip.